time and with this people nicely waiting, I think um, I will begin to talk to you. Welcome and thank you for attending this evening. Um, tonight's program is sponsored by obviously the Harris Center, the Chesterfield Conservation Commission and the Friends of the Chesterfield Library. I'm Pam Walton, a member of the Conservation Commission and I wanna give you a little background on how this program came about. In August of 2019, Tonight's presenter, Susie Spickle, wrote an article for Elf magazine about Fisher. And uh, a Spofford Lake resident, Betty I Tyler. Could you try again? Read the article, as did I, and suggested that Chesterfield should invite Miss Spickle to speak, not only about Fishers, but also about other mammals, especially bear. You see, there'd been quite a few bear sightings down around the lake in uh, May, June, and July. Um, and so the program came to be Coyotes, Fishers, and Bear, oh my. And as I said before, that's with apologies to Reggie Pippa. You see, introduced Susie. Susie spent her youth um, in the wild edges. Like you left off at, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. <clears throat> okay. I could have right. filled it in, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> ah, Okay, well, Brooklyn, New York, and then Southern Vermont was also, um, you know, certainly one of her areas that uh, she learned from. Um, uh, after several summers at the Massachusetts Audubon Society and interning as an environmental educator at Central Park Conservancy in 1991, she came to the Harris Center and has been here ever since. Um, when she's not out catching frogs with uh, preschoolers or tracking bobcats with middle schoolers, I've done that. You're on, you're on mute. Can't hear Ken, you. I've got it on. <laughs> <laughs> or hawk watching with her own children, Susie enjoys writing like the article on fishers in Elf magazine. So Susie, tell us about coyotes, fishers, and bears. I'm sorry about that. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> I don't Pam. know what happened. <laughs> I appreciate the introduction and I'm really grateful to the Chester, Chesterfield Conservation Commission and the Chesterfield Library and the community um, for showing up. This is so exciting. If you have any kind of video issues, again, if you turn off your video, that might help uh, with your internet speeds. And so enjoy the program, um, should be fun. Thanks, Miles. I really appreciate that. And I'm really excited to be asked to talk about this topic. Um, I just want to be very upfront. We're going to explore how we perceive and live with some certain wild animals that don't always behave the way we want them to, or sometimes show up when we don't expect them to, sometimes even um, eat things that we are upset about. Um, but my hope is that um, I'm gonna hopefully get everybody here thinking about how we can coexist with these incredible wild creatures. And I'm hoping that um, by doing that, you'll feel more comfortable with um, the world that we live in and also understand why it is vitally important for these animals to coexist and for us to coexist with them. So um, I always like to start this talk with um, kind of this iconic picture of, they call it silver hair and the three bears. You could call it Goldilocks and the um, three bears. And we are really gonna be talking about how we interact with some of these larger and unexpected predators in our life. Um, so um, coyote, bears and fisher really represent something truly wild in our very civilized world. You know, we go about our every day and um, on the edges, sometimes we're lucky enough to see one of these animals. And this was really actually hard for me why I only chose three, coyote, bear and fisher, but they're the ones that receive the most complaints from people um, through fishing game. People are unhappy with um, with these animals for a variety of reasons that I'll be talking about, but I certainly could have included other animals that we might perceive as nuisances too, like white-tailed deer or skunk or um, even porcupine. So I hope that maybe this will be a part of a bigger series. Um, and I, I just throw that out there to Chesterfield to think about. Um, 
So uh, these three animals are the ones that get the most non-positive interactions. And sometimes the way that this is measured is when people call the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department and they might be calling because they're excited to see a bear in their backyard, but that call is often kind of listed as a complaint. Um, so I just kind of put that out there. We have lots of different ways of sharing our excitement about these animals and maybe a better way would be to share it with your friends um, through um, Facebook or texting or just a conversation that you might have at the store. Um, and when we do have interactions with some of these animals, this is oftentimes portrayed in the media as uh, a negative impact and negative problems. And there are, I'm not, I don't want to sugarcoat things. These animals can do things that, um, that are dangerous to us or uncomfortable for us. So we'll be talking a little bit about why um, they might be behaving that way. Um, so I'm sure that many of us have had our very own interactions with these animals. Like maybe you've witnessed a bear doing this acrobatic um, stretch to get to your bird feeders or or perhaps you've had a pet that's had a run-in with one of these predators, or maybe you were just out hiking and um, you came across a large bear and it made you feel a little uncomfortable. Um, and all of those things, I understand um, that is true. And I thought that this might be an opportunity if people wanted to share in the chat, you could talk about um, by chatting in the chat feature kind of your own experiences, your own stories of what you might have seen or heard or what you might have um, heard other people experiencing. And this is just a gallery right here of photographs of bears and fisher and coyotes up to things that um, might make them considered nuisances or worrisome um, in your backyard. And I, I wanted to say that we actually have a very old history with predators. Our connection to them goes way back in time. And they and you can tell this because they figure in our mythology and they hold kind of a collective spot in our psyche through our stories and our artwork. And we, and we still tell these stories, Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf. And um, lots of times bears end up in the stories as um, kind of a scary thing. And there's lots of artwork about this. So, um, you know, it's part of what we experience. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Hold on, phew. And it, I mean, if you go way far back in time, we were really vulnerable and maybe still are um, preyed upon by large carnivores, including the cave bear, which is depicted in this picture and the dire wolf. Um, and I like to think about E.O. Wilson. He's the great ecologist and thinker. And he, with his colleagues came up with something called the biophilia hypothesis, which suggests that humans have a deep and ancient need to connect with the natural world. And that this connection actually gives us great joy and understanding and makes us exactly who we are as humans. But I wanna suggest as, as um, many of us might be thinking about, sometimes um, biophilia can also have a dark side, biophobia. It's sort of the yin to the yang. Um, and I just wanna raise this as a question. Do we carry around a deep, kind of hardwired fear of carnivorous predators in our being. Um, and maybe this is so embedded in us because we would have had to have been very alert to them. Um, if we weren't, we wouldn't be here today. Our ancestors would not have persisted. And so perhaps we have a flight or fight button that when we see one of these larger predators, um, we it, it accesses it for us, we feel it. Um, but I wanna suggest that there might be another way to see these animals. And I'm hoping that we can leave this ancient history behind us and maybe see the coyote, the fisher and the bear just as they are. Animals just like us trying to get by in a place that we all call our home right here. And this quote by Jane Goodall gives me kind of um, how I think always about my teaching. Um, and I do a lot of teaching for the Harris Center around nature and, and my premise is that, that if we can understand, we can care. And that was um, something that Jane Goodall said from observing chimpanzees. And I would like to be able to shift our reactions 
to these large predators and these animals that might make us uncomfortable by helping us know how they live, to educate us. Why are they showing up in our backyards? Why are we encountering them more often? Often, Why did the summer seem like everybody you knew saw a bear? What was going on? So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go over each animal and it's gonna be really short, which I'm sorry about. Um, but I do wanna say the Harris Center is offering a course um, I think it's in the month of December on large carnivores and it's being taught by a wonderful wildlife biologist, ecologist who studied large predators um, for many, many years out West and it's called Carnivore Cousins. You can check it out on our website. So if you want more in depth about carnivores, you might consider signing up for that class. So I'm gonna start with the Eastern Coyote. Um, and the Eastern Coyote is known or was known or sometimes is referred to, I love this name, as the song dog or the brush wolf. And um, the coyote was an animal that wasn't really present in our, in our land up until recently. What happened was um, there's really no historical evidence of an animal that's a coyote in New England. We had wolves, and if you look back at indigenous stories and, and kind of their oral history, the wolf played a role in the New England um, woodland Indians, but the coyote was not present. And what happened was, what, what the theory is, is that when wolves became extirpated or extinct from our area, it opened up kind of a, a niche for coyotes to move into, but it took them a while to get here. Um, so since the mid 1900s, coyotes have been slowly moving from the Midwestern states through Canada and into the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states. And just this um, past fall, we actually had a speaker from New York City who runs the Gotham Coyote Project. And that project is documenting coyotes in New York City. They take the subway, they hang out by restaurants. So coyotes have been really successful. Um, the first first verified account of coyotes in New Hampshire was in Grafton County in 1944. And since then, it took really 19 in the 1970s through the 1980s, coyotes spread across all of New Hampshire and they're common and um, seen in every county in our state, which I just think that's sort of fascinating. One theory that um, that explains this migration is they kind of followed the highway. The highway left a band of um, access for them. It also had a lot of roadkill associated with it. And so that is one of the reasons they think they might have um, been able to kind of slowly make their way here just following that pathway. I love this picture. The coyote is a true flexivore, um, which just means they're generalists. They really eat whatever food is seasonally abundant. And that's important because um, the seasonality of it is, is the key to this. So this spring um, and summer, we had a drought. And when foods that were normally available were not available because of the drought, animal behaviors really change because they couldn't find their normal things. Coyotes feed on mice and squirrels and woodchucks, snowshoe hare, they'll eat um, newborn fawns. I'm gonna tell you this and, and, and we're gonna talk more about this later, but they do eat cats, um, but we're gonna talk about cats when, when we talk about another animal more in detail. They will eat your house cat and there have been um, recorded, um, documented, evidence of them eating small dogs as well. They'll eat dead things, amphibians, garbage, insects, and fruit. They um, utilize forest habitats and shrubby open fields, marshy areas, and river valleys. Um, and when their food um, that they normally eat isn't available, they're opportunistic and they'll eat what they can. So you might remember a few years ago, we had the squirrel apocalypse where we had tons and tons and tons of rodents and then there was no acorns for them to eat and then there was no um, there was very few squirrels. Well, that was really hard on an animal like a coyote and they people started to have more interactions with coyotes. So really when when our environment is stressed through natural things like drought or um, icy and a very icy winter with a hard layer of snow and ice that the coyote can't penetrate, they'll be seen more regularly kind of coming to your human areas. That um, coyote is a social creature. It selects a lifelong mate 
and they are very vocal during their breeding season, which runs from January to March, which might explain why you hear them howling in the winter time. And you have to remember too, in the winter when it's cold, um, sound really travels and there's no leaves on the trees to kind of block that sound. So lots of times people will call us at the Harris Center and tell us that they heard a pack of coyotes that sounds like wolves. And it's usually during this time when they're breeding. And that's to kind of find each other and figure out who's who and connect. Um, I actually like the sound of it, but I can understand it. It is a little spooky, but that's what's going on. If you hear it, it's not that they're, they brought down a deer and are celebrating it by howling at the moon about it. They're more often just communicating to each other. And during that time of the year, it's a lot about um, where are you and are you available? Um, are you around? So when they do find their mate, um, they both raise their young, they, they work together. So it's, it's different than um, other animals or other mammals that we might have um, or be familiar with. So the male sticks around, he helps raise the young. The pups are born in May. And within a year, some of the pups will disperse. They'll head out and make their way. And they might have to travel really long distances to find an available territory that's not taken by other coyotes, which is why they've made it as far as New York City, because lots of habitat is not that available for them. So they have to keep going until they can find a spot that they can call their own. Sometimes some of the coyotes will stay with the mated male and female, the offspring. Oftentimes it's a female. And and those will form the small packs. And their territories can be very small from five square miles to about 25. And um, they'll really defend their territories from other coyotes, unrelated coyotes and um, other intruders. So that's another time you can hear them howling and calling is right around now. And maybe some of you have heard this, you can share that in the chat. This is the time of the year when the young are um, kind of being pushed out and sent on the way and the pack is sort of separating so that um, it's easier to support yourself as a coyote, as an individual coyote in the winter. So in the winter time, the packs kind of disperse a bit and there's every coyote for themselves. And then they'll come back together when um, the season warms up again. And so this time you might hear some howling where they're kind of on their way. And I guess what I would say is, um, here's some really important takeaways about coexisting with coyotes. And I'll be the first to admit, in fact, I just shared this with a friend of mine. I like to trail run and a, a couple of, Falls ago, fall ago, I was running on a, a pretty remote trail and I saw these two coyotes go out right in front of me and they were very bold and it made me uncomfortable. And I walked away from them, staying facing away from them, making myself big and clapping my hands. Um, and they just looked at me and they kind of went on their way. Um, and there have been some incidences of coyotes and humans um, or coyotes kind of involved with humans, but normally this is very uncommon. But what you can do to prevent coyotes from coming into your area and kind of hanging around is you can be a good homeowner by cleaning up your, your yard. If you have pets, you want to put their food inside your house and you don't want to let your cat out at night or any time and I'll talk more about that soon. Um, and you don't want to just let your small dog out at night. You want to have them leashed and really keep your eye on them. Um, if you live in an area where you're hearing a lot of coyote action, you want to make sure your garbage is secure. And if you have livestock, electric fences are really, really good deterrents. They're not just good deterrents for um, coyotes, they're good deterrents for even deer or other animals like that. Um, and, you know, it's really about kind of keeping your area clean. If you have, um, you can, I guess what I would say is coyotes often get blamed for events that are really more attributable to the domestic dog. So people who let their dogs run, um, it's a lot of times it's dogs or automobiles. So let's say, for instance, you're 
your cat goes missing and you might assume right away it was a coyote or a fisher, but a lot of times it's the automobile um, that is responsible. And when you go out and look on the road, you're like, well, there's, I can't find my cat. It wasn't hit by a car because I don't find it on the road. But that's because as soon as it's carrion, it's usually eaten by the carrion eaters, including things like coyotes. And when they do stomach content studies of animals like coyotes, and we'll talk more about this with the fisher, they often find, they can find house cat remains, but they cannot determine if those remains are from a cat that they killed or a dead cat found on the road that they consumed. So I hope that's helpful. And if you have any questions about what should I do if I encounter a coyote or you wanna ask some more questions about coyotes, send it in a chat to Pam. And at the end of the presentation, hopefully I'll be able to answer the question. You can always email me too at the Harris Center. It's just my last name, spickle at harriscenter.org. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the Fisher. And I love to talk about the Fisher. I've done like hour long talks just on the Fisher alone because the Fisher is sort of an underdog. It has a really bad reputation. Um, and this reputation I really assert is un, it's unnecessary. The Fisher is a predator and it is a really good predator, but we have a lot of wrong information about this small animal. In fact, at its most, it weighs only 15 pounds. So sometimes um, in the past, they'll have shut schools down because they'll see a fisher outside, or there's a report, there's a fisher in the neighborhood, keep your kids inside. There has never been a report of a fisher eating a human. <laughs> um, they couldn't, they only weigh 15 pounds. If you were Maybe if you were, if the fisher was a lot bigger, maybe we would worry, <laughs> but I don't think we need to worry about the fisher um, doing something to us. We'll talk more about our pets in a few moments, but I want to clear up something about the fisher. Uh, we often in New Hampshire hear the fisher referred to as a fisher cat. Sometimes it says fisher cat. The fisher cat, we even have a baseball team named after them. The fisher is not in the cat family. It has nothing to do with cats. Um, cats are in the feline family and fishers are in the weasel family. There's lots of theories of how this mismatched name got to become, how did the fisher cat get that name? And some of them have to do with that they might sound like a cat. There's a, lots of mythology around a fisher screaming, but Actually, when you read scientific information about the fisher, they don't actually make that sound that we often associate as a fisher scream. Those sounds are often made by foxes. Foxes make over 30 different vocalizations. Many of them sound like screams. They even have a call named the vixen call that sounds like a lady shrieking. Porcupines also make a lot of noise. Um, and it, there's very little um, scientific record of fishers screaming. I'm not saying that they don't. I've definitely had people say, I heard it, I saw it, but it's uncommon. So it doesn't sound like a cat screaming and it doesn't quite look like a cat screaming, but how, or a cat, or a cat in itself. So how did it get its name? Well, the, the best explanation is that when the settlers came here and they saw it, it reminded them of a cat from their own neighborhood in Europe, the pole cat, the European pole cat. And it should because the fisher and the pole cat are all members of the weasel family. And they all share some common visual characteristics of having very long bodies and shortish legs. And there's 56 different types of fisher, uh, of weasels in the world. And all of them have these similar characteristics and they all have a pretty stinky scent gland that they use regularly. And they are all really excellent hunters, kind of predators of exceptional skill. And I think that that might be part of what um, makes us uncomfortable about the fisher. They are really good predators, just like any member of the weasel family. And a lot of times people might have an animal get into their chicken coop and kill all their chickens and often think that it's a fisher, but more often than that, it's actually its smaller relative, the weasel or even the mink, because the fisher, um, it's pretty big, it could get in your chicken coop, but it's the weasel that can slip through the chicken wire that might get in. So I wanna say, um, what does the fisher hunt? And one time a newspaper reported that it, you ever keep your Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts inside because a fisher was about, it might eat them. 
It does not eat Girl Scouts. It does not eat Boy Scouts. It doesn't even like those cookies. Instead, it's a generalist hunter. And the bulk of its diet is composed of mostly small mammals, like think mice and voles, amphibians and reptiles, um, birds, bird eggs. They love bird eggs, hair, porcupine, dead animals. And they'll even consume some fruit and nuts when they're desperate for food. They're only like six to 15 pounds. So, um, they aren't eating very, very large things. A cool thing about the fisher that people do know, and I'm gonna use my pointer to kind of, well, you can kind of see it. Um, there's porcupine quills. This is fisher scat, and those black white tipped um, parts of the scat are porcupine skill, quills. And fisher are really one of the only mammals that will take on and eat a porcupine. And, um, they have a couple of different ways of doing it. And what I've read and what I've heard from other people who have um, tracked fisher, one technique is that porcupine climb trees and so do fishers. Fishers are kind of arboreal. They're very good at tree climbing. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, but they'll go up a tree, chase a porcupine up it, and then they kind of snap at the porcupine and snap at the porcupine and the porcupine backs up and backs up and backs up and the fisher is very agile. It has that big bushy tail to counterbalance it. And as the porcupine is backing up, the fisher is biting towards its face, trying to get towards its face, which is unprotected with quills. And eventually the porcupine will back so far up on a tree branch that it falls out of the tree and um, lands on the ground. And then the, it's maimed or hurt or dead and the fisher can flip it over. The underbelly of the porcupine is unquilled and that's where they'll eat it. So that's one method. And the other method is on the ground, pretty similar, where the fisher will be um, very much jumping around it and snapping at its unprotected parts, um, its face, and kind of going for its belly. And then it can stick its paw under and flip the porcupine and go for the purchase of right into the porcupine's um, soft area. So those are kind of two methods that have been recorded on the way that fishers eat porcupine. And when, when porcupine and fisher live in the same area, the porcupines are, are on their menu. Um, and I have to say, por the porcupine population is really uh, in a boom right now. Just think about how often you drive and you see a roadkill porcupine. That's a lot of porcupines. And part of why we might be having a boom in the porcupine population is we have a, a dip in the fisher population right now. There's not a lot of fisher. There's a lot of studies around why in New Hampshire we're in a fisher decline, but it seems that we don't have that many fishers in this particular area of New Hampshire. And as people who might have fruit trees or um, garden, um, you might perceive a porcupine more of a nuisance than a fisher. When the porcupine population goes way up, there's a lot of pressure on your orchards and your gardens from the porcupine. So I'm all a fan for having more fisher to help control the porcupine population. Um, and I wanna just say the fisher has tons of amazing adaptations, but one that I love to share with people is the ability of the fisher to rotate its hind feet. So if you think about these are your paws or your hands, we can kind of rotate them 180 degrees. Well, the fisher can rotate those hind feet 180 degrees so that when it's coming down a tree, its feet will turn and its claws will be able to find purchase on the tree and it can actually go head down first, just like a squirrel, which has the same adaptation. And I, I want to just let you know that fishers are excellent squirrel eaters. Um, and and they're really amazing at chasing them. I had the opportunity to watch a fisher chase a squirrel through the trees and there was a lot of jumping from tree to tree. And I think they've measured fisher jumping from tree to tree can reach over seven feet, which is pretty amazing. So let's talk about what we all know people say, a fisher ate my cat. Um, and I'm going to say some things that I always feel like, oh, maybe people are going to not want me to come back to Chesterfield, but I have to say this as somebody interested in the natural world and wild animals, and that is that, um, that cats do way more damage than an animal like a fisher. 
Um, and if you wanted to compare kind of the deadliness of a cat to a fisher, the cat, the house cat would win. In a 2013 study put on by the University of Georgia, in the US alone, they determined that house cats are responsible for killing between two and four billion, that's a B with a bill, billion, um, wild animals a year in the US alone. 500 of those are songbirds. The number one killer of outdoor cats, and this is really important because people do have their cats disappear. The number one killer, according to other studies done, is the automobile. So the number one killer of an outdoor cat is not the fisher or the coyote or a great horned owl, it's the automobile, it's us. We run them over and we don't find their bodies because scavengers eat them. Um, so I just want to say, I wanna end this by saying um, that if you have a house cat, the responsible thing is to keep your house cat inside. Um, in my line of work, we have a saying that says, everyone is someone else's lunch. So um, if your house cat is outside, it is possible that it might get eaten by a wild predator like a fisher or a coyote or you know, a bobcat or whoever, whoever's out there. But your cat is eating a lot more wildlife and they don't need to because you feed them. So they're just killing because that's an instinct in them. So please, please keep your cat inside. What I like to say is cats should be house cats and kept in the house and fisher should be outside because you probably wouldn't want to live with a fisher in your house. <laughs> um, it, could be, it could be a wild time. And I'd like to suggest that the fisher is an animal that in this talk today between um, coyotes, fisher and bear, fisher really suffers from a bad reputation. And I'm gonna appeal to everybody here who's ever felt that maybe they were blamed for something they didn't do um, to consider that when you think about the fisher next time, um, that it gets blamed for a lot of things that it, it doesn't do. And in fact, something else to really consider is um, fishers and animals like fisher, kind of the middle predator, are really important in the control of rodents. And rodents are the main vector for deer ticks so if we don't have these middle predators, if we don't have animals like fisher and coyote and weasels and um, uh, raptors in our areas, then we'll have higher rates of deer ticks because the mice, which carry the deer tick disease, the Lyme disease, um, aren't being consumed and kept in balance. And then that becomes a problem for us. So I appeal to your health consciousness as well to give fishers a chance. Now, again, if you have any questions about fishers that I didn't answer, or you want to um, share an, a story, send it as a chat to Pam and um, I'll try and answer that question or comment. I wanna talk about black bears. And I love to talk about black bears because when I first moved to New Hampshire from Brooklyn about 30 something years ago now, um, we didn't see black bear. Uh, we just didn't see them that often. They have made a stunning comeback, particularly in the Monadnock region. And that has a lot to do with the incredible landscape that the Monadnock region has to offer due to conservation commissions like Chesterfield and organizations like the Harris Center um, protecting land. And it's made it good habitat for black bear to make a comeback. And these are powerful, huge animals. And anybody who's ever encountered a black bear in the wild, it is kind of, it does take your breath away. It does press your, your uh, cave person button down, like, oh my gosh, it's a bear. I've had those experiences. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about bear habitats and bear behavior, and then a little bit about what to do if you encounter a bear. So I just want to share that they can be found in many, many places um, and in across the US. Um, and they are found in every county in New Hampshire now, which is exciting. And they have um, different size ranges depending on male or female. Female black bears have a smaller range, one to 50 square miles, and males have a larger range. And that's pretty typical with most mammals. Females are smaller and the males kind of roam between them. Male um, 
males can have a 10 to 290 square mile um, home range and they often overlap several female habitats or female ranges. And their diet is, is hugely varied. Um, they take advantage of seasonally available foods when they come out from their den in the spring, they eat those emerging greens that we have and those new succulent plants that are coming up. And when they do studies of, of bear diet, they find that eight, 80 to 85% of a black bear's typical diet is actually plant material. That's a huge amount of plant material. And the remaining 15% is made up of animal protein. And that can be um, any kind of animal from insects. They eat a lot of insects, grubs and bumblebees, things like that, to bird eggs, ants and voles and um, carrion. They'll eat dead stuff as well. So they really have, I like to call them the local local boar. They really are eating what's available. In the summer, after the spring, after a kind of waking up, their diet will kind of shift. And I just kind of want to go over the seasonality of their diet because this is when we can sometimes see them. When they wake up in the spring, they're very hungry and they might come to your yard and eat your bird feed that you might have out. Um, and in the summer, they might come to your yard or you might encounter them at some blueberry bushes or blackberry bushes. Um, and then as the summer kind of progresses in the fall, they're, they're eating the hard mass, the beech nuts and acorns, hickory nuts, things like that. As the um, summer begins to fade and autumn begins to really be here, they are really trying to pack on the food. They engage in what's called hyperphagia. I myself have been known to do this. That's called excessive eating, especially at this time of the year. Um, you just eat a lot. Bears can eat up to 20 hours a day at this time of the year. Like right now, there could be a bear outside snuffling around your acorn tree and eating what you've got out there. Um, they have to eat this much food because they're getting ready for the winter. Um, but this is oftentimes when their food is not available, that we run into a bear problem um, where bear food, like the summer with the drought, and there was a very limited um, berry crop out in the natural world, if they weren't being watered, like at a berry farm, um, they came in, they might've come in and um, been involved in eating um, maybe your beehives, um, maybe they took your bird feeders and ate those and ate the things in them if you hadn't taken them in. They might eat even your garbage if it's left out there. Um, they eat your agricultural crops. Um, they've been found in campgrounds. Um, and we're gonna talk about it and I'm sure many have heard the saying, a fed bear is a dead bear. Um, but in this particular summer, um, because of the drought, there was a lot more bear action coming in because they just couldn't find the food that was available to them. Oh, sorry, I just like skipped way ahead, sorry. Um, but they, they really have to be eating because if they don't eat enough, if they don't pack on enough weight through spring until late autumn, then um, they're not gonna have enough body fat and body mass to survive the winter. And I wanna also clear up something about bears in New Hampshire, do not hibernate completely. They're not considered a true hibernator. They go into a sleep and wake or snooze and wake or semi torpor. They're kind of, they, they can be roused on a warm day. Um, if we have a warm spell, they might come out and stretch. Um, but this is really hard times for the bear. They really um, go into a, when they're in a deep sleep, they'll lose 50 to 60% of their um, body. Their, I mean, their breathing will drop to 50 to 60 times, a, wait a minute, their heart rate, sorry, and breathing will drop. Um, and their body temperature will drop seven to eight degrees and they'll lose a quarter of their weight. And they really will um, lose their body heat very slowly because they have this very thick coat that helps them. And they have a very lowered metabolism and something that always fascinates kids when I say this, they, ver they don't defecate during the winter. They have what's called an uh, anal plug. It just plugs it up and it kind of packs everything down and their kidneys slow down, their whole system slows down. And when they wake up in the springtime, the first thing they need to do before they can really 
get back to business is they have to pass that um, out. And scientists, when they find those, researchers can find out a lot of information about the bear and they can do a lot of studies. And they find out that um, bears actually eat their shed skin during hibernation, they eat their like top, their pad shed and they eat them and that's found in the plug, kind of cool things. I'm pretty interested in um, what people find in those things. And they find out a lot um, about the bear and its health. Um, I, I want to say, this is so cool. The female bear during this time of semi-torpor gives birth to her, her cubs. She gives birth while she's in her den. And this is an actual picture of a newborn black bear club, cub. It's about the size of a sweater. It's blind and hairless. It only weighs that very little bit that you see. Um, it's practically born almost premature. And the, in the female, just nurses them. So she really has to have enough body fat on her to be able to sustain not just herself, but also her cubs. I want to say so much more about this, but I'm paying attention to the time. So I'm going to move along. Maybe I'll have to come back and just talk about bear. Um, the cubs grow pretty quickly in, the, in being nursed by the mother. And when they emerge from the den in April, they can weigh about nine pounds. So they go from just weighing that little bit of ounces to weighing from anywhere from about four pounds to nine pounds. And they um, get nursed through their first summer, but they also begin to eat solid food. And the mother really is busy teaching them. Um, they're very busy exploring and learning and the mother is there to guide them. Uh, they follow their mother all through that first summer and even the following winter. And then when they're about 16 to 17 months old, then they disperse. Um, and the females, the young females can stay in the, in the mother's territory, but the males have to leave. So I always like to think of bears as matrilineal. They pass their, their landscape their territory onto the females. And so let's just talk about the nuisance problem of bears. And I'm not, I don't wanna sugarcoat this because bears are up, oh, they can be naughty and they're clever and they learn. So if you have your bird feeder out, they will come back, they remember it, they come back and check it. And if they have cubs, they teach their cubs to check it. And so you're, I always like to say, we have to be responsible neighbors. And so when, when Fish and Game says, you need to bring your feeder in from December 1st to April 1st, that's really, oh, you can put them out from December 1st to April 1st, sorry. That's really true. That's the right time to put it out. After April 1st, take your bird feeders down because once a bear gets habituated to coming into your yard, um, it will stop at very little to get to your bird seed. Um, if you have a shed and you keep your bird seed in the shed, it will rip your shed apart. They have an incredible sense of smell. My friend, Mark Ellingwood, who's um, a fishing game wildlife director, he, he described them as um, a tremendous sense of smell attached to a tremendous appetite. They can smell I think it's like 10 miles away on, a, on an average day and more if the wind is blowing right. So really what we have to do to be a good neighbor and coexist with bears is we have to clean up our yards. We have to put away our dog food, our um, bird seed needs to be kept in a spot that they can't enter. Um, and we cannot intentionally feed these animals. Uh, once we start doing this, then that becomes a deadly choice for the bear. And they, can, they do not unlearn that behavior. Uh, in fact, I just read in the paper about a woman who just got fined for hand feeding a bear in Tennessee or someplace like that. So what I would say is really take in your bird feeders, clean up your yard um, and um, yeah, just try to be the best kind of neighbor that you can. Don't leave your garbage uncovered. Um, keep your, if you have um, livestock food near your chicken coop, um, don't keep it outside. Don't keep it, keep, bring it in. Um, secure your barbecue. They've been known to get into people's barbecue. And, and when you're camping, you want to really take good care of your food to keep a clean campsite. So I'm just gonna wrap up. I'm so sorry, I just rambled on. Uh, um, I'm gonna end with this. Uh, what is the future you want? And I'm gonna end with Wendell Berry, um, who's a wonderful writer and he wrote this. 
We have lived our lives by the assumption that was what was good for us would be good for the world. We have been wrong. We must change our lives so that it will be possible to live by the contrary assumption that what is good for the world will be good for us. And that requires that we make the effort to know the world and learn what is good for it. And I'm just gonna end with that and I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen and see if there's any questions or comments. So thank you guys so much for listening to me go on about some of my favorite animals. And Pam, you got any questions? I do have some questions for you. We'll start back with um, questions that, <clears throat> that we had on coyotes um, from Bill Anderson. Um, no, not to let your animal out at night is something that you said. Well, Bill has a puppy and goes out with that animal. Um, and, and, you know, with his headlamp in the light, he has seen eyes. Little disconcerting. Um, and then a couple of days later, he saw some bear scat. Um, should he be concerned? Great question. Um, I've had the same thing. I had a puppy and, and I saw those eyes shine. Um, what I would say is, um, and this is, this is true um, in many cases, bear mm -hmm. are very shy and worried and timid of people um, if it hasn't been habituated. And that's, I want to say that's typically true. Um, so if you are feeling nervous, a really good strategy is have your light on because that's going to give them a spook and you can make some noise, clap your hands, put your hands up in the air, stomp your feet. Um, you can clatter something. Um, so if that, that might be a good strategy. If you're going out at night with your puppy, I know when I had my puppy and I had to take her out at like three in the morning, um, I would definitely do that. A lot of times the eye shine that you might be seeing might be deer. And I, um, there's some really great kind of guides about what kind of eye shine, how to identify sort of eye shine. So you might want to check into that. I did write an article and you can find it on um, the Northern Woodlands website or the Harris Center's website on eye shine and what I found out from walking my puppy and seeing eye shine. So great question. Okay. From Sue Sawyer, um, what about chickens? Now, oh, yeah. a couple of comments with bears and chickens this summer, especially. Yeah, they were rough on the chickens this summer. I gotta say so many people really had bear problem with their chickens. And that is really uncommon behavior that really had to do with a lot of the normal foods not being available. So normally in the summer, they're really eating a lot of the berry crop and they're out there. And as you can see, um, the research says that 80 to 85% of their diet is really plant material, but there wasn't a lot of, of plant material for them. So people were having them come in their yard. The best way to protect your, um, anything from your bees to your chickens to other livestock is electric fence. Um, bears learn very quickly the power of the electric fence. And you can actually get an electric fence, wrap it around your coop and your area. And then this might sound very unfriendly, but I'm just gonna say you can bait the fence. And that really teaches them a lesson. So baiting the fence is you put tin foil on the fence with peanut butter or sardines or something. And so the bear is drawn to the fence and they put their snout to it. And they, they're unlike us, they don't wear shoes, you know? So they're ungrounded. So when they get the shock in their nose, it's very powerful shock. And um, when I had bees, um, you know, I try to maintain my fence regularly, but sometimes I didn't, but I had baited it. And I would know that the bears would be there, but they recognize the fence as a danger. So my suggestion is if you have livestock, um, particularly chickens, you probably want to invest in electric fencing. Um, that's my suggestion. Mm -hmm. And, and, and hopefully next summer, um, they won't be back. That's the thing is bears can learn. So they might learn, wow, I remember that. That was some good chicken and they might come back. So you want, if, you, if you're gonna have chickens again, um, you might wanna invest in your electric fence for April, starting in April. What about coyotes? Will they also go? Coyotes, yeah. Um, yeah, they'll go to, um, and they also are deterred by the electric fence. Electric fence is just such a great um, tool for small livestock and large livestock as well. So, I mean, 
there's always things that fail. You know, if you don't trim around your fence, it can short circuit and you have to really be vigilant. So, um, you know, but that's good. If you, if you're really into livestock, you can get a, a guard dog. The Morena sheepdog is a really great investment um, and it, it does do its job in deterring predators. All right, going on to Fisher, uh, Nancy Goodell. Um, she heard in her backyard Fisher screaming and the neighbors thought that they were people actually having a fight. But Nancy said that the Fishers were actually mating. Is this a common thing? Well, I would say that, um, and Nancy, I, I know those sounds are really interesting um, to hear and a little um, shocking, but my experience is that, um, and in reading the scientific literature, is that the fishers don't really scream. And what you might have been hearing is porcupine screaming, and they will scream, and they do sound like people screaming at each other, high-pitched screaming. Um, I always like to joke, well, you would scream too if if you were a porcupine and you had to mate, but um, you know, they make a lot of noise. They're very vocal. Whereas the, the scientific literature shows that fishers are not that vocal. So unless you actually saw the fishers mating and you saw them screaming, you might be assuming that they were fishers when in fact they might've been porcupine or um, even fox. Fox really, the vixen call is thought to be made by the fox, the fox after or during around mating and courtship. So you might've heard that too. What I would suggest is look up online. There's such great resources online. Listen to um, Lang Elliott. He's, oh, she did see them mating. Wow, Nancy, you're so lucky. Wow, if you ever see it again, I want some videotape of that. Um, that's so cool. Well, I mean, I, there's always things to be learned. So wow, how lucky. I wish I saw that and heard that. Next, uh, David and Tricia Miller asked, uh, will a fisher feed on a roadkill porcupine? Yeah, they'll eat roadkill. Um, yes, they will. And they, they eat a lot of carrion. I mean, their preference is not carrion, but they'll eat what they can. And they, they're you know very good at eating the things they need to eat to stay alive. So um, if they come across something, they'll eat it. And it's interesting, um, I used to see a lot of fisher sign tracking. Um, I haven't seen that many in the last few years. So I would just say this winter, um, since we'll all be hanging around home a lot, if you are up for tracking and you find any great signs of fisher, foot, footprints or paw prints or any, even a fi or fisher's mating, um, send me a picture at the Harris Center. I would be just so excited. Um, from Pierce Rygrod, he wants to know what are the primary predators of fishers? Great question, Pierce. Bobcats. Yeah, good. yeah. Fisher, um, not much is going to eat a fisher once they pass um, into adult stage. But just like many, many young mammals, they are at risk by, of being eaten by other other predators, other ma mammal predators, and some aerial predators. So when fishers are little, They'll be eaten by bobcat. Um, they could be eaten by a coyote, an adult coyote. They can be taken by a great horned owl. Um, so once they pass from being very little to the adult stage, then not much is going to eat an adult fisher. Um, and again, I guess I have to come back to that the automobile is really the thing that, that takes them. There is trapping season still on the fisher um, and that is, um, another way that we don't, we might be losing fisher population. So thanks Pierce. In terms of the fishers hunting at night um, or hunting, I should say, Jackie, yeah, a line wanted to know, is this done mostly at night? Yeah, they're primarily kind of um, crepuscular, kind of dawn and dusk um, at nighttime, but you can see them at other times of the day. I've seen them in the middle of the day. Um, I was hiking in a remote spot in Vermont, and I actually smelled the fisher before I saw it, because a fisher, like all mustelids, has a very um, musky odor. And when it's sort of alert to the world, it will send out the odor. And, and I said, wow, what's that smell? And then I watched it kind of come down the tree and cross a trail. So I just love to say, um, you know, keep your eyes open. Um, and if you do see Fisher, let, let me know. Mead, Keto, and I are, are collecting Fisher sightings across the Monadnock region. Going on to bears. Um, yeah. 
you saw, showed some pictures with with beehives and yeah. Miles Stallman said he's always nervous. Yeah. Um, and did you have any additional thoughts for beekeepers? Yeah, I do. Um, I was a beekeeper for about 10 years and I loved it. Um, and Miles, maybe I can come over to your house and, and see your bees one day. Um, but what I learned very fast was um, your electric fence needs to be pretty wide around your fence because they'll put their paw through the holes. If you have like the ones that are more like this and not the wiry one, kind of the netted one. So if yours are open, um, they can put their paw through the fence and flip the, um, the boxes over. So you kind of have to really have a big area around it. And also I used motorcycle straps and I strapped my hive together so that if they did knock it over, or if anything knocked it over, maybe even a big storm, um, the hive didn't come apart. So I would say um, some motorcycle strips are really helpful. And also um, keeping a clean bee yard is helpful too. So if you're sugar, if you're feeding them sugar water, you know, just make sure it's kind of clean and tidy and you're not spilling a lot of sugar water around your hive, which is a good thing anyway, because um, that might incur um, rating from other bees. So tidy yard, motorcycle straps, electric fence. Yeah. Now going back to the fishers, Robert Christensen asks, don't weasels such as fisher cats, are they considered as rodents? Oh, great question. So no, um, mustelids are different than rodents. So rodents are made up of animals like from the smallest would be mice and voles to the largest in New Hampshire would be um, beaver and woodchuck and porcupine is in there too. And they're defined by mostly eating plant material, although they do eat a bunch of other stuff. And they have those two front yellow incisors in the bottom ones like that. <laughs> It's like good to know that will be preserved on YouTube for a while, um, you know, kind of like this. Whereas mustelids are actually true carnivore. There are carnivora um, and they have really different teeth. They have fangs and incisors and they eat primarily only meat. They are huge hunters of animals in the rodent family. And I just want to again say that um, it benefits us all to have the those meso predators, the middle predators like the um, Fisher and Fox and Gray Fox um, to be eating a lot of those rodents that carry diseases that can make us sick and, and kind of knock the balance back into place. Again, from David and Tricia Miller, um, this is a great question. What about these animals in Lyme disease? Are they immune? Uh, wow, I don't know the answer to that. I, I would, my, my guess is maybe no, but I don't know. And I'm really curious and I really appreciate that question. I'm going to look into that. Um, all I really have read about is the role that these animals do play in helping to kind of um, curb the rodent population and thus um, knock down the, um, the Lyme disease um. transmission. Uh, Tuisa Bada asked, um, what about compost? So I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Right there. <laughs> Such a great question. I didn't even talk about compost. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's actually um, at the Nelson School in um, Nelson, New Hampshire. A colleague of mine was out tracking with her students and they watched a fisher for like 20 minutes eating the compost out of their compost pile. So a really good thing is um, trying to have a covered compost pile and they sell the ones that are kind of contained. So if you're having a lot of problems um, to with um, predators coming into your yard and kind of raiding your compost and it could be anything not I shouldn't just say predators it can be skunks can get in your compost and raccoons a really good way a good strategy is to have an enclosed compost pile and one of those black things that's really kept close the tidier that we can keep our kind of human stuff um, particularly food, the better it is for the wildlife around us. And that's a good note for me. I have to put an enclosed compost um, bin on my Christmas list. list. <laughs> it's mine is open and I just encountered a skunk out there. Not luckily I didn't get sprayed. Um, Pierce had another question. He has uh, peach trees and are bears likely to go for his peach trees or yeah. pears? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, Yes, 
uh, coyotes too, um, they will come and eat your, uh, your peaches and your plums, your pears. Uh, bears, huge apple eaters, huge. Um, and they, uh, anybody who's walked through an old apple orchard in the autumn, um, you will notice huge amounts of bear scat um, that look like the bear barely even ate the apple. It's just giant patties or giant bear poops of, of apples. Um, yes, so if you're really um, worried about your crop being raided by something like a bear or even other um, raiders like raccoons, um, your best bet is probably an electric fence around your peach trees too during the season that they're most ripe. Um, and again, that, that takes a lot of work because you have to mow it so it doesn't ground out and you have to kind of know when to put it up and you have to have it. Um, but I don't know, I guess, you know, we can, we work probably pretty good at sharing. So unless you're really like making your living um, through the food that you're growing, um, I don't know, I guess you could try, try to share a little. The thing is, they're not always great shares because they'll eat all your peaches and pears. But thanks, Pierce. Another question about the eating. Um, Birgitta McAlvey says, have bears been known to go after sheep or llamas or alpacas in this area? Yeah, um, yes, they have been. Um, sometimes we'll get a call from the Harris Center as, um, kind of like, oh my gosh, I think a mountain lion came and, and ate one of my sheep. Um, can you come and check it out? And I've never had to got a chance to go on these calls, but my um, some of my colleagues at the Harris Center have Mead Caddo in particular. And yes, they will take um, they will take some livestock um, when they can and when they're really hungry, sheep, um, goats. Uh, even there's been some incidences with horses um, not being taken, but kind of being um, kind of tried to be taken. So yes, I mean, we have to remember that the, they are hungry, they're predators, they're hunters, um, they're like we are, they don't know kind of the difference between what they, what, what, what we consider ours and what what might be in their territory. So again, I think it's a matter of us trying to make the best situation to protect the things that we had, um, have using electric fencing. If you really have a lot of livestock, um, they really have great luck with guard dogs or, um, and um, a really wonderful speaker who you might consider having is, um, oh, now her name is escaping me. Um, she, she does, um, Coyote Project for New Hampshire. Chris, I can't remember her last name.